There's also the IACME accreditation, which follows somewhat closely to what, uh, to what NAME does. And there's also the NIJ death investigator guidelines that I showed you a picture of earlier. So those are really good references for you to be looking at. So let's talk about the guide for, um, or the guide for manner of death classification. Again, you, th this, is, this is fun to read. Uh, it's how, what, what, what NAME recommends we do. It doesn't say you, sh you, you have to, it's not a shall. It's not uh, a shall recommendation. It is what's considered best practice. So let's talk about Russian roulette. You know, when somebody <clears throat> puts a bullet in the gun, spins the chamber, and puts it to their head and pulls the trigger, what's the manner of death for, for Russian roulette? Anybody want to take a guess? Or let's do poll, let's do show of hands. If you think a, a Russian roulette death should be considered uh, an accident, raise your hand. Got a few. What about suicide? Lot more. What about undetermined? That's an option. Name recommends that Russian roulette deaths be called suicides. Because if you put a gun to your head and pull the trigger that may or may not be loaded, that's a volitional act, right, that there's inherent risk of death. Now you can argue about that all day long. What if the person was intoxicated, you know? Uh, you know so there's every argument about that. But it gives you an example of the types of classifications that you can do. So the other thing that has come from NAME, and you were asking about the drug overdose recommendations, this is the paper. If you're, if you're defending drug deaths, you want this one. It's the recommendations for investigation, diagnosis, and certification of deaths related to opioid and other drugs. It's the, it's the opioid position paper is the short name. Again, it's available on the NAME website. You need to get this. This is the one that says that when you're ruling on the cause of death for drug overdoses, you need to consider scene investigation. Autopsy is best practice. Toxicology, review of medical records. Those things have to be considered. And it also tells us when there's multiple drugs on board, because we know now in most drug overdose cases, rarely is there one drug. There's always a whole laundry list of drugs. And it kind of tells us how we take all those into account. So this is a great resource. Again, available on the internet. I mentioned earlier uh, the these standards by the, Amer the uh, Academy Standards Boards are done by consensus. So the way that works is um, the OSAC that I mentioned, th this is a, a federal uh, group of committees um, that produces forensic science. It's part of the Forensic Science Standards Board. So each committee, and I, again, full disclosure, uh, I am on the, uh, the, the medicine committee. I'm on the medical legal death investigation subcommittee. So these groups write a draft standard that gets put out for public comment. And once the public comment and revision period is done, then it goes back to the Academy Standards Board and actually becomes a standard. You can go to the Academy Standards Board's website and look at all the published standards for each specific discipline. Ones that you probably are, uh, would be interested in, this one comes up a lot in drug overdose cases, guidelines for opinions and testimony in forensic toxicology. The reason this is useful is because it says, and this drives me nuts, because a lot of times I will get disclosures from toxicologists that will tell me what the cause of death is. Forensic toxicologists and toxicologists in general are not qualified to offer opinions about cause of death. That's not the role. The cause of death expert is the forensic pathologist. And it says it right here, a toxicologist should not opine as to the absolute cause of death. Again, this is uh, the uh, ASB 037 for forensic toxicology. A toxicologist should not perform extrapolation for drugs other than alcohol. What does that mean? That means that if the, in the post-mortem toxicology, the person has a level of X, they may try to go back and say, oh, well, four hours later, he or she must have taken this amount. That doesn't work, except for alcohol. It works for alcohol. It's scientifically valid for alcohol, but not other drugs. A toxicologist should not calculate the dose of a drug based on a post-mortem concentration uh, drug, con drug level. For the same reason, I can't look at a level in a post-mortem blood sample and say, this person took 100 milligrams of oxycodone for a lot of different reasons, but the main reason is something you guys have probably heard of called post-mortem redistribution. Drug levels change in the body after death. Outside the scope of this talk, but if you're involved in drug cases, if you haven't heard PMR, you need to get you a new expert because post-mortem redistribution is very important when interpreting post-mortem toxicology. It's another reason why if you've got a drug case, you want a forensic toxicologist, not a medical toxicologist. 
Medical toxicologists work on living people. Forensic toxicologists are specially trained to interpret dead people blood. Living people blood is not the same thing as dead people blood. Before we go ahead and break down the rule and start talking about the different subsections, let's talk about another problem here, and that is dual role testimony. So the first thing we talked about, again, is the wolf in sheep's clothing, and here the government is trying to go ahead and bring testimony that is really expert testimony through a lay person. This is a little bit different. What happens here is that the prosecutor will try to go ahead and use an expert to testify as both a lay witness, lay in the sense of a fact witness, testifying as, you know, the, as to the things that, you know, that they saw, he or she saw, uh, or, or, or observed, or whatever, during the process of the investigation. Now, and this is not categorically pro prohibited by the rules, but it is fraught with tremendous danger, and we have to be ever vigilant against this. This, this is a typical technique that the government has. It is a dirty technique, and we got to call them on it whenever it happens. Now, so here, you know, we introduce another uh, character in the cast of characters of the low rent, you know, budget circus, uh, and this is the jack of all trades. Now, let's look at a great example on this one, and this is the Garcia case. And we all have had a case like this. So, you know, here, the defendant is charged with conspiracy uh, and possession with intent to distribute heroin. So here, the district court allows an FBI agent to testify as an expert on, uh, on uh, this is on drug-related conversations, you know, deciphering the conversations you know, and all that. I mean, you think that this person is like a code breaker type thing. And then the court also allowed the same individual to go ahead and testify as a fact witness regarding the investigation. This is just not some you know, FBI expert that the, the government pulled in to talk about this narrow issue. This person was involved in the investigation itself. So you have somebody that's essentially wearing two separate hats two roles. The defendant, of course, here is convicted, you know, because of what, you know, the, the testimony the district court ended up allowing. Let's see what the fourth, the fourth circuit, you know, has to say about this. So the fourth circuit here says that the, in a situation like this, where you have the government trying to bring in a witness that's going to be testifying in two separate roles, as a, as a fact witness and as an expert, a court has to take a number of steps to protect the rights of the defendant. And those steps can include requiring that the witness testify as to the different roles at different times to make sure that, okay, now you're testifying as an expert and now you're testifying as a fact witness. Okay, so that is def that's one step that the, the circuit uh, says, you know, should be taken. Another one is uh, us using cautionary instructions and then requiring that the government ground their question on either a fact question or based on expertise to make it very clear to the jury what is going on. This witness now is testifying as a fact witness this witness now is testifying as an expert to try to distinguish that, okay? All right, now, uh, then we have witness must be qualified as an expert. That's, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's really the first requirement under 702. And, you know, and, and just a couple of preliminary hearings, uh, things here. You know, the, the witness can qualify as an expert based on knowledge, skill, expertise, training, or education. There's, in essence, five different ways of doing it. Of course, the judge is supposed to determine whether the proffered expert is qualified. And then the burden, of course, rests with the proponent of the evidence. Um, now, the problem is that this is one of the big issues that's going on uh, right now, is that, you know, the, that, uh, that, that judges are you know, misstepping on both those two steps. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Now, uh, these are a, you know, a few arguments that we, can, uh, that we can raise whenever we got an expert as far as the issue of qualification. 
One, and that is that you know, the expert is not qualified because the uh, expert's experience is not relevant. Uh, the expert's experience in the relevant area is shallow or anecdotal. And all this I have, again, this is in, in, uh, in, in, in my book. Um, the expert lacks recent experience, and the expert has provided no methodology or guiding principles that will support her opinions. So those are some of the, the principal uh, uh, arguments that we can go ahead and raise dealing with the expert's uh, lack of qualifications. So here we get to go ahead and meet another one of our friends as far as the gallery or, of, or the cast of characters from the low rent budget uh, circus. This is the huckster, okay? The huckster. And uh, uh, later on we'll meet the snake oil salesman. It's a close relative of the huckster, but a little bit different. You know, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So this case here is fantastic. You know, and uh, it, it really, you know, illustrates this point as well as touching upon other issues dealing with 702. Very, very good case. Now, here what happened is that um, the defendants are charged with conspiracy and intent to distribute meth. Now, what happened is that they, uh, because of a minor traffic infraction, the car in which the defendant and the driver are stopped. So the, uh, the um, officers see one of the defendants, uh, and she was shaking and reading from a sheet. Well, they look at the sheet, and the sheet is a prayer. And the prayer is in full in the opinion. The prayer is to the Santa Muerte, or the Holy Spirit of death. Okay. Now, so what happens here? This is like it's 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 just really pretty unbelievable. And again, this should, this should be the subject of some Netflix uh, uh, show. Is that the, this record permits this witness that the government is offering and supposedly is on religious iconography. That's what the field of expertise of uh, of uh, the uh, of the expert. And this expert, who's a U.S. Marshal for crying out loud, is testifying that, um, that the uh, Santa Muerte is connected intimately with drug trafficking. And the mere fact that this woman was reading this prayer, that, you know, that was certainly evidence that needed to be considered in the determination of whether she was guilty or not. Um, She's convicted at trial and receives a, a brutal amount of time, of course, as, as in most of these cases. Now, the Tenth Circuit here, you know, looks at the case and, you know, and, 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 and uh, makes a number of observations that are really pretty excellent. This is a really, really good case. Uh, but just, uh, you know, two that are pretty significant. One is that the expert provided absolutely no methodology whatsoever, okay? Instead, the problem that the district court had, and the reason why the district court went ahead and found what it did, is the problems that recur in cases dealing with forensics uh, throughout the whole country, at a federal or state level. Another evidence kit you can have is the drug facilitated sexual assault kit. If there's a suspicion of being drugged, then we do a kit. How is the kit done? I've seen these kits done in the ER. I was an ER nurse for 10 years. We would get police that would bring in people and maybe involved in a car accident and want a tox screen done, but officially by the lab, not just by our hospital. And we would fumble over these boxes that have all the stuff in it to do the blood and the urine because we didn't do it that much. And you can mess these up because as nurses, we use alcohol swabs to do blood draws. What if you use an alcohol swab to do a blood draw and that blood shows an alcohol content? Is that right? Is it wrong? You should use betadine. All right. I didn't have a warning on that. It was a drawing, but I apologize. <laughs> so that's my diagram that it's not my diagram. That's somebody else's diagram that I do have linked, but it's what I use in all of my 
reports and how to explain the genitalia because this is one of the better ones that I've found. So what do we look for in injury to the female? Laceration, abrasion, bruising. The areas that are important here in sexual assault where you're looking for injury is below 3 and 9 o'clock. Okay, anything above that probably related to something else, which I have a case that I will get to to give an example. So we're looking below 3 and 9 o'clock for injury. Most common area of injury, the posterior fourchette. Okay, you have the labia minora on each side of the vaginal opening. They come together at the bottom and they meet at the posterior fourchette. You can actually pinch that tissue. It's very thin tissue. And it tears and it rips and you can have a tear. Oh, I'm a little, there we go. Up and down. You can have little tears. You can have all abrasions in this area. Another term you might see, also commonly injured, is the fossa navicularis. That's the area between the posterior fourchette and the vaginal opening. This area here. Third injured area is labia minora, all right? So that's where you're seeing the major injuries in sexual assault, but also in consensual sex. This circle around the vaginal orifice, that's the hymen. You can see it in adults. It's different in children. I could do a whole presentation on the hymen, but I'm not sure you guys would want to be in on that. Um, so. That's the main thing we're looking at here. The perineum is the area between the external genitalia around the vagina and the anus. So you can see tears go into the perineum. Um, you can also see injuries around the anus. You can see injuries to the inner thighs from bruising. Again, consensual and non-consensual sex. What's toluidine blue dye? It's not used in every program. Um, it's used in a lot of programs wrong. And it's meant to be able to visually enhance injuries in photos. So we take this dye and we apply it to the area. We do not apply it to any mucosal tissue. Mucosal tissue is wet tissue, like the tissue inside your mouth, right? That wet tissue. It's highly vascular, so it has blood flow. This microphone's not my friend. And it heals really quickly, which is another thing you'll hear, maybe in second place after not having injury and sexual assault doesn't mean you didn't have sexual assault. So yes, this area does heal very quickly, but the mucosal tissue is not this whole area. It's the hymen, it's the vagina, it's the inside of the labia minora, the outside of the labia minora, to the posterior fourchette, which turns right here into skin tissue. That's not mucosal. So the toluidine blue can be added to this area around the bottom end of the posterior fourchette and around the anus to enhance injuries that you already see. It's not for a search expedition because it, it doesn't sound like rocket science. You put on the dye. You get a gauze, you get some sort of lubrication or Vaseline, and you wipe off the blue area, and then bam, all you have left that's blue is, is an injury. It's not like that. This stuff like, is hard to get off. It's the areas that it shouldn't. So when used appropriately, it's good to enhance something you can always already see. If you have a picture and you don't see anything, especially if they're using a colposcope, which has magnification, and then you see dye applied and all of a sudden there's an injury, something's wrong. I had a case where there was dye applied wrong and it was literally around the opening, one here, one line here, one line here, here and here. Well, that was a very symmetric injury, but it wasn't. It was where the wrinkles were when she closed her legs and opened them up and that's where the dye wasn't removed from. That's a big deal. The case is resting on injury seen in a picture with dye applied in incorrectly.